a call to order the regular city council meeting of September 9th, 2024. Mr. Clerk, the roll, please. Mayor Bixon? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Salvia? Here. Council members Hauser? Here. Jones? Here. King? Here. Sage? Here. And Trent? Here. Thank you. Will you please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome, everybody, on a beautiful night. Um, we're going to start out with public comments, scheduled and non-scheduled presentations. Um, first presentation is going to be from Gail Petrick regarding the Mount Avon Cemetery headstone cleaning. Welcome, Gail. Thank you. Thank you for having me tonight. Let's see if we can pull this up. All righty. All right. Well, I am here tonight on behalf of the Daughters of the American Revolution, specifically the Stony Creek chapter of the NSDAR. And we'd like to talk to you about uh, some projects that we would like to embark upon. You know, in a little over a year and a half, less than a year and a half, America will celebrate her 250th birthday, and it is never too early to begin planning for that. Um, so we would like to talk to you tonight about the Adopt a Gravestone Project and rededicating and marking up to four Patriot Graves, Revolutionary War, Patriots that are in Mount Avon Cemetery. Okay. Our goals of this project are to really recognize the patriots and their grave sites. In the process, we would like to educate the community about the American Revolution and encourage patriotism through community involvement in cleaning the headstones in Mount Avon Cemetery. So as you know, Mount Avon, I won't deliberate on this, but it is really, truly a historical treasure. Mm -hmm. Dates back to the very early 1800s. Um, has revolutionary patriots in there as well as all of our world wars. It also has uh, patriots there from the War of 1812. So a lot of history there. Um, we have identified four <coughs> possible patriots. Three of them we believe that we have all the necessary information and documentation to the, get them verified. And then Benjamin Loomis, we are still working on his documentation. But if you walk around that cemetery, you will notice that um, a lot of the markers are in disrepair, and a lot of the markers are really discolored. And that's from the lichen that has grown on them over the years, and they haven't really had any much upkeep. So what we would like to do is embark on uh, sort of a two-prong project. One would be, let's clean up the grave markers that are existing. We, our first focus would be on that lower right-hand corner in the blue. That's what's known as the old burial ground. That's where three of the four patriots are located. Um, I estimate there's probably close to three to 400 markers in that area. They're almost all of them are the sort of that tombstone white marble. And you can tell that they're becoming blackened uh, and gray over time. So they really do need a good cleaning. What we would like to do is involve the community in this. Uh, Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, high school teams, like the robotics team, for example. A lot of the high school groups are required to do community service projects. We would like to propose to those groups that this be one of those projects for them. Families, corporate sponsors, and obviously the city of Rochester sponsoring this project. At that same time, uh, the DAR will be working on doing the final verification and getting all the approvals for the markers, and we'll be fundraising for those markers, each marker. You see samples um, there of what they can look like. We're actually preferring the one on the far right, which is the bronze marker um, inside the cement. We think that that is um, a nice touch, and so that's, that will be our goal. Those will cost us about $1,000 each, and so we will be fundraising for that. Milestones of this project. Number one, you are really the second group we have come to. The first group was the Rochester Historical Commission in August. Um, we need your support. We need your approval. Um, we need to get the Patriots verified. That's all on the DAR. 
And we're proposing that there be two adopt a gravestone cleaning days for the community to participate in. We were hoping to get one this fall, but I think we're running a little short on time. So we're probably going to end up having two planned for the spring. Once we get those uh, approvals, we'll acquire the markers and then have the dedication ceremony day probably either fall of 2025 or our backup would be spring of 2026, which would be our 250th anniversary year. Um, sample project plan, very light, um, still needs to be a lot of things filled in. But from this, you can see some of the major points. Um, one of them is city legal that we need your involvement in. There are some questions that we do have. Um, a lot of marketing will need to occur. We need to really get the community and engage some community spirit around this. And so, um, as well as obtaining all of the necessary supplies. So. Speaking of supplies, um, there are a few things that we are asking the city to come up with. Um, the solution that is approved for use on this white marble is it's called D2. And as a matter of fact, it's the only solution that is truly approved for restoring old early markers. Um, and the other supplies um, are specific brushes. They have to have, they cannot be very stiff. You can never use a wire, uh, metal brush, wire brush on, on these markers. The putty scrapers have to be a very flexible plastic. It actually, as you scrape, it sort of deteriorates a little bit. Um, and then the, probably the most expensive part is that down on the lower left, that DeWalt manual pump sprayers. You cannot just throw a bucket of water over your marker. You have to spray it down, then you apply the D2 solution, then you spend some time scraping, and then with tongue depressors, um, etching out the lettering that, that becomes visible at that point, and then you're going to mist it down. Okay, so you just can't take a bucket. So we do need these misters purchased. What will this cost? So. Um, for 24 teams of two people each and figuring that a team on a couple hours could probably clean three markers, this will have an initial cost of about $1,400. It's not that much. Ongoing supplies for the next group of 24, so every time that this activity would occur, there would be another $650. Essentially, uh, you can clean the markers after we make that initial investment in the brushes and the, the DeWalt sprayers, after that, we can clean a headstone for less than $10. So that's very reasonable. Um, we are soliciting um, medical offices for the face shields, tongue depressors, and gloves. So, all right, so in a nutshell, what do we really need from you, the city of Rochester, to move forward? Um, we need your support and approval for this, and we need a, a singular point of contact, someone that we can liaison with. Um, we need legal to manage any legal concerns. Um, what do we need to have approval to do this project? You know, we didn't install these headstones. They've been there for 150 years, some of them. Um, what is that, you know, what is the liability and is it okay for us to go and clean them? Um, minors will be involved. Do we need a consent? The chemical is not dangerous. You'll see, I have a link to a video. You'll see the person in the video is not wearing any eye protection or gloves. However, we're working with minors here. I'm going to ensure that they all have uh, face shields, gloves, etc. Um, we need to have some sort of registration. So why you say, well, why do we have to register? Well, if we get 20 people, we know how much, how many supplies we have to order. If we get 200 people that say, oh, we're gonna come on this Saturday morning, then we know how many supplies we need to order. So we need some sort of a registration um, service that we could participate in. And then we would love to be in the spring and fall uh, Rochester newsletter that goes to the community and pull in the other commissions that are available to help with this project. And the onus would be um, on the city of Rochester for the major equipment, so the D2 solution itself, um, 
the sprayers, uh, plastic scrapers, things like that. One thing that did come up when we were talking with the Historical Commission is the potable water. Uh, they identified that the spigots, a lot of the spigots in the cemetery are not functioning, and we will need um, quite a large supply of water in order to do this. We'll have to be refilling those sprayers. All right, this is uh, for your reference. It's a link to a video. Uh, it doesn't take long, but you can see how over time, this is about three months, and what the headstone originally looked like. Initially, you'll see some improvement, but you won't see a lot. It takes three months. It's a biocide, and so it, it actually d works to destroy how the lichen communicates from one cell to the other. And so it takes about three months before the lichen is, is actually removed. Okay. There is one other aspect that I'd like to make you aware of, and that is because there are patriots in Mount Avon Cemetery, you do have the ability we could um, place an America 250 marker in Mount Avon Cemetery. This is what it would look like, um, these markers. We are putting one in Pontiac at the Oakland History Center on October 19th, um, and we would love to have one also in Mount Avon so to celebrate our 250th. And that is it. Hopefully I've kept it under my 10-minute a lot of time. <laughs> I think you did a great job. I think... I think we're probably all in yeah, agreement to do that. I think maybe have the city manager appoint somebody from the city to be a contact person. Yep. Um, we'll take and care and of then, it. I don't know, Ms. Attorney Croc can give his view on it. I, somehow I can't believe it's, we can't not clean, a, clean one of those. Um, and to me, all those look very good. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's yeah, go forward with it. Anybody mm -hmm. have it? Uh, Council Member Jones? Um, since I'm on the cemetery committee, if, you, if you're appointing someone, I'd be happy to raise my hand to be the, the contact if um, so needed. And then I do think there's um, some legal pieces involved in this on touching headstones. So I do think we have to do a little bit of research mm -hmm. to find out if this even can happen. It's a great idea. I'm so excited mm -hmm. well, about do you it. Want, do you want to be the... I'll be the contact okay. if that's okay. Is that all? Okay. Anthony, that Do you want to help? Okay. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Perfect. Steve and I will She's willing, okay. I'll share. <laughs> I'm willing to share. Mr. Patrick, you're, you're the other cha share. <laughs> Historical. By so, default. Well, right. And I know the time is kind of of the essence, even though it is a year and a half away, but it sounds like it takes time to do all of this. So we'll, yeah. we'll yeah. work on it as quickly as possible and get back to you on what we find out. That would be great. And then Mr. Mr. City Treasurer, um, and first, also, thank you, Brian and Anthony, for being here tonight. Mm -hmm. um, um, substituting very nicely. Um, with the budget, do we need to have a motion come back to us, or how, how do we do that to pay, pay for some of that if we choose to do that? Uh, since this will be in the next year or two years budget, we'll, we can put it as a line item in the next cycle. I already got a note for that, so we'll make sure to have a placeholder in there for that. If I could just yes. add, yeah. stage. Go ahead. add to that line item, uh, let's just include the cost for everything. The markers, the 250 marker, the supplies, the ongoing supplies. It's going to roll up to under $10,000. Oh. So, <laughs> Got it. Will do. Councilmember Jones? Just one, Mark. Just thank you. I mean, it's people being interested like this that make these exciting things happen in our community. So thanks for your work on this already. And... Um, it's exciting for the yeah. town. So. I'm just, I'm glad to do uh, it. Council Member um, Trent. Well, I would be remiss if I didn't say thank you. I know Gail and I have been working on this together for a little bit, and she has worked so hard and very passionate about this project. And and it's it's going to take some work. And I truly appreciate all the effort that you're doing in this in this. Yeah. Um, once we get that old burial ground done. It, moving on to the second oldest section that was outlined in the red, there are some absolutely stunning memorials there, and if they were cleaned up, they, it would just be spectacular. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I've seen that section. Very it's good. beautiful. Okay, mm -hmm. thank, thank you. you. Thank well, you that, very much. That, that was pretty easy, Gail, wasn't it? It was very easy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have a presentation from Jim Nash, our, our Oakland County Water Resource Commissioner, to talk about 
green stormwater infrastructure and just general flooding and issues that you know we've talked about on this council and again this is just to kind of get the conversation going so commissioner nash welcome back to uh our rochester hills city council well i really appreciate being invited thank you love talking about this stuff we've talking about this stuff for a very long time right. um so what am i doing here <laughs> what What did I say? Rochester Hills. Oh, man. I, I never make that mistake. Sorry. Hey, man. It's Rochester, uh, Mr. Nash. I'm sorry? It's Rochester, not Rochester Hills. Oh, I am so sorry. No, no, I, 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 I said I, I, said, no, I, said, I, I apologize to anybody watching. Yeah, no, it was actually not you. you I think yeah. you knew where you were. but I do. I'm so sorry. No, it, it okay. was actually the mayor. So, I'm sorry. We, we, um, we actually appreciate the... Uh, um, Councilwoman Trent inviting me to here. I, we we um, are doing green infrastructure all over the county. Um, we're working regionally to do more around that. So I understand that more and more communities are being affected by by the flooding with these extreme weather storms that are coming, and even even the ones that aren't as extreme as as um, could could be are causing things because there's just no place for the water to go. So. One of the things that we recognized early on is that we have to go past just the gray infrastructure, the underground pipes, pumps, tanks, all those things. They cost a tremendous amount of money to put in, to operate, maintain, and then eventually replace. So we're looking more at um, the, uh, the, natural the natural solutions to this. So really, green, green stormwater infrastructure is about keeping stormwater out of our systems as long as we can, as much as we can, before... Um, it, it starts flooding. It starts having issues with that. We need to make sure that the, the every every place has a, a somewhere water to go that can uh, infiltrate into the ground. Um, if we have too much uh, impervious surfaces, it can't help it, but um, but uh, flood. It, it collects in the in the most uh, the lowest elevations. So that's that's what you're seeing in on your on your own you know land here in in Rochester. Um, so. This is, this is one of the things that we're doing, whether it's the, the, the communities themselves uh, on your own projects, on your own land, uh, the, the businesses and industries in, within your, within your uh, jurisdiction, or the residential areas, which is mostly residential in most communities around here. Um, so we're doing this kind of work to just to start out with educating folks, because a lot of people have never heard of this. Um, so rain gardens are one of the most common things that people have heard of. Have you guys heard of rain gardens? Um, so rain gardens basically are put in a place where you're going to have water coming off your roof or off your driveway um, to a place where it can get uh, set, uh, settle into a, a low elevation and then immediately infiltrate into the ground. We do this by just having uh, basically a, a, a small garden that we, we're planting native plants in because native plants have much deeper roots. When water, storm water hits the ground, it follows whatever roots are going into the ground. So right now you see these are the kind of plants. Non-native plants are is what most people play. Right here you have grass. If you keep your lawn grass about two or three inches tall, then that means the roots are only about two or three inches deep. They go about as deep as the grass goes. So when, when water hits that, it, within a first you know, quarter inch of rain, those are all filled up. So anything past a quarter inch, it runs off a yard just like it runs off your driveway. There's basically nothing holding it to pull it in. Um, so we want to have these native plants on the other side. This one here is called buffalo grass. Buffalo grass, even though it looks pretty much like regular grass, has extremely deep roots. It can go eight, nine feet deep. Again, all that is going to bring down uh, water into there so it doesn't go off into the nearest storm drain. So these are, more, these are different kinds of plants um, that, that, you know, you see the, the cone flowers. Uh, those are very, very common. Those have deep roots, and then this one here has roots that can go 30 feet or more deep. The more you're doing, the more you are. I'm not sure exactly what your soils are here. You have a layer of clay probably, right? Mm -hmm. That insane. impervious that it's, you can have mud above it and the clay is completely dry. These roots will go past that. They can go through that clay and then go to the next layer, which pulls it down actually into your aquifer. One of the problems we have with having the modern kind of storm drains we have is they go to the nearest place, and then they go way downstream before they go on the ground. So the, uh, the aquifer here doesn't get recharged by rain like it does in nature. 
So this is going to help that. It's going to help keep that aquifer recharged. You don't want to have your drier aquifer. I don't know, you're probably mostly um, a well, uh, 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 city water here, right? You don't have very many wells? No, yeah. we have our own our own city water. Okay, you have your own water. water. That's right. Half and That's half. right, I forgot. Half so, and half. You're, you know, you're, you're not worrying that, that so much, but we want to make sure that the drainage coming off this isn't going to cause flooding in the neighborhoods. That's our biggest issue. Mm -hmm. So we're doing things um, in, around the county that, that are kind of different. So, I'm sorry, we talked about rain gardens uh, here. So rain gardens can be a very good-sized garden. I have two small rain gardens along at my property. I live in Farming the Hills. I have a, a drainage pipe that goes down, and it used to discharge all the time. But now I put two, two small rain gardens in there, so it dumps into the rain garden, and then until it fills up, it doesn't go down this, keeps going down the, the drain, and then it goes into another one. So I can, I can limit way more, much uh, more than I used to be able to limit going off my house and my property. You can do that in any home. Any home can do that. Whenever you're having downspouts that come into just into the drain, uh, into the, your yard, again, that grass means they can't accept much, so they go right off into the street. So this, if you build something small right in front of your, uh, your downspouts or connect a few downspouts, um, I, again, a lot of people do that. And that way, all that water from your downspouts, that first inch off your roof, will end up in there before it starts even going down your yard into the, into the uh, storm drains. So the more we can keep things out of the storm drains, the less flooding you'll have because those storm drains won't get maxed out and then flood all of them. And um, you'll be able to, you'll have native plants, which, which bring fr uh, fertilizer, uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, pollinators. We have many more pollinators when you have these native plants because the, the, the moths and butterflies come and then the birds come to eat them and then, you know, it's, it's, it brings more wildlife into your neighborhoods. Um, plus, it, it's, it's beautiful, and it serves a purpose for stormwater. So all those things add up. Um, so rain barrels are another one. I have two rain barrels at my house. So the, the ones, uh, parts of my house that go right into the, uh, the driveway, which would go down, you know, into the storm drains, I have them there. So I can use them to, to water my yard after the, uh, I mean, sorry, my flowers uh, after a storm. Um, so it's, it, it's useful. I'm not using city water to do that, which has a little bit of chlorine in it. Um, and uh, and it's, so it saves money, and in the long run, it, it's one of those things that more people put on their houses, the less chance you're going to have flooding down the, down the street, you know, as it goes down elevation. Um, so you can purchase these. They're all over the place. Um, they're easily found. They, they can, you can get a super simple one for like 50, 60 bucks. You can get a more fancy, bigger ones for, uh, you know, 150 or more, but... Um, they're, they're very useful, and, and many, many people enjoy them. I, I really like that. People don't think about trees. Trees are actually a very good um, way of, of controlling uh, stormwater. Before, first of all, they hit the leaves first. A lot of that stays there. Some of it gets absorbed in the leaves. The rest just evaporates before it even hits the ground. Um, less hits the ground, so uh, it, when it does, it can follow the roots of the tree like it follows any other plant's roots. And they can go down in. And then when dry periods, uh, they, they pull up water out of the ground and evaporate it into the sky again. And um, that can, between storms, you can have some of that pulled up. And this year, we had way more storms than we've had in a few years. So we, we were getting that these, the turnover between storms can be pretty quick. So um, all of these things, trees are, are, are very helpful for that too. Um, Things like permeable payment, disconnecting your downspouts. One of the big issues, homes built before the 70s had downspouts that went right to footing drains. And footing drains collected that downspout water and then put it into the sewer line, um, your normal sewer line. That causes supercharging of sewer lines in a big, heavy storm. Um, and it's, it's just, if, if we can disconnect them, it's, it's a good thing in the long run. Uh, some communities have disconnection programs going to do that. Um, green roofs. One of the things, a lot of buildings have green roofs. Uh, Lawrence Tech has a green roof on their student services building. All of that water is uh, hit, when it hits that roof, it's all absorbed into, the, into about six inches of, of um, media that allows the water to hold for a while and then pass through. That means that all that water from that footprint won't go into the storm drains. Um, with the, OU, with the o, uh, uh, Lawrence Tech system, they actually all feed into a, a, a big giant uh, tank underground to, that, again, they, they do their irrigation with. Um, and then permeable pavements. Permeable pavements are becoming much more common and much more uh, accessible to folks. Um, permeable, you can have it either uh, concrete or asphalt. It's got little spaces all through it. Uh, it's not quite as strong as regular, so you don't usually 
park a whole parking lot with it, you'll put it along the edges. So when the water is shedding off that parking lot, it's going into the, uh, into the uh, basically impermeable pavement. Um, again, at Lawrence Tech, they did a, a science experiment where they put a half acre parking lot that had one storm drain in it, used to whole be always kind of flowing into that in a storm. Uh, they, they changed it and they, they put permeable pavement all around about four feet around it. And then these, these new technologies that, that drive down into the ground, that pull the water down into the ground. And now instead of having uh, the first inch of rain go right into that storm drain, you can have a fire hose on one end of that parking lot and the, none of the water actually reaches the storm drain. So they're very effective and you can do them in much smaller spaces like behind uh, you know, you know the, the, the alleys that go behind your st uh, street front um, uh, buildings there. You can put that kind of thing in a very small space and it has a real effect on how you can pull down that water. We have some uh, advice we can give you around that too. As does SEMCOG. SEMCOG is a tremendous resource for this kind of information. <clears throat> they can come out and help you kind of design your systems. Um, we've worked with them on many times. So this is kind of how we're looking at what, what we're seeing nowadays. The average temperature just since uh, 1900 has gone up 2 degrees Fahrenheit in this region. That's significant. That's a, a significant increase. This total precipitation has gone up 11% just in that same time period. And it's since just since, what is it, uh, 58, is I forget, I think it's, yeah, it's yeah. 58. The, the storm events, extreme weather has gone up 37% in this region. That's what we're seeing nowadays. You, I don't know if you remember, but in, in, this, in the uh, uh, January 15th of 2020, we had a storm in this whole region, it was all of, all of Michigan and a big chunk of Canada, three and a half inches of rain in the middle of winter. That would have been about, what is that, about a 20-inch snowstorm. We just don't have them anymore. When big systems coming into this area, they're so warm, they're not producing snow anymore. They're producing rain. And we're seeing these kind of storms that we just never used to see. And that's, that's one of those things that, that's important. Great Lakes ice coverage, and that's one of the reasons we're seeing this, because it used to be ice cover on the Great Lakes. Ice doesn't evaporate. In the summer, in the winter now, we're having giant parts of our Great Lakes that are, that are open, weather, so, uh, open water. So they're evaporating all through the year that they didn't used to do. And frost free, the, 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 the first frost is getting later and the last <coughs> frost is getting earlier. That's, that's showing that our climate is changing. And the biggest thing that we're getting an effect from that in the Great Lakes region, the whole Great Lakes basin, is extreme weather. Um, it comes across the Midwest with warmer atmospheres, so it can be more dense with, with water vapor. And then when it hits the Great Lakes, it's a heat sink, and it drops it all. So we're seeing that much more commonly. We're going to have to be planning to do this over these times. Now, this is a kind of a breakdown of, of the real the, the data points for all this, and um, it's just undeniable. We have the, There's a Great Lakes collaborative uh, uh, research organization between all the universities in the Great Lakes states, they're tracking this very thoroughly, and they're telling us we have to become more prepared for these storms. So more and more communities are doing that. We're working with a system in, in the great, uh, as an example of, of possibilities of doing this, we're doing a pilot program in the George W. Coon area, which is south of you guys. It starts at uh, Birmingham and then goes south to the county border. That's 14 communities. That it's a combined water and sewer system, stormwater and sewer system. Um, and we're doing a, a, a rain smart program, and this is aimed at, like I said, the residential areas, because that's the most parts of most of our communities down in this part of the county. Um, and so this is, it's, it's for a pilot program for this, because we went to EPA and we said, we're really interested in looking for a grant to do something like this, because we really believe it would help stop flooding in that area. And they said, well, we need you to do a pilot project to show it's effective and it works. Um, so we're in that process right now. They're talking $10, $15 million um, as, a, as a, you know, start out with, with a grant to do it countywide. Um, so what we're looking for is first we're looking for people that are in this area. Uh, we can give up to a $2,000 uh, rebate for, for putting in rain barrels, rain gardens, or shade trees. Um, the pilot offers $2,000. Uh, there's also a, a, a small section of it, about 30% of it, that's set aside for folks who are low income or disabled who can't do it themselves, and we'll have the great uh, the, uh, the Clinton River Watershed Council do it for them, um, and, and then still get that, that funding. So this is a way of setting it up. So it, part of this is, a, is about uh, education, so folks know what this means, that it's, we, you can have beautiful little gardens all over the place, and we bring in pollinators, and it's helping with stormwater. Um, first time you get... 
stormwater coming in your house, whether it's combined or separated, you're going to do everything you can not to have that happen again. So you want to make sure that, that you're learning about these things. We can help you do it. The Clinton River Watershed Council is a really good resource for this kind of thing. They're, they're super good at it. One of the things that they're doing for us in this program is once people are accepted in the program, they go out and they look at their property. What's the best places for green infrastructure and what's the best things to use for it? Um, they're really good at that, and, and already we've had like 30 or 40 installations. Um, we were expecting maybe have 150 people sign up for it. Almost 600 have signed up for it. So there's a tremendous amount of interest in this. You guys could do it too. Um, we could be part of us. So hopefully if we get this grant, we'll be coming out to you guys and seeing if you'd be interested in working with us on this. So this is the kind of thing you can do as, as a, a really good way of doing it. Um, <laughs> And getting that message out, getting out that we can help with stormwater in the long run, each of us homeowners, each of us business owners, we can do this together. And, um, and you guys are, are a wonderful city to, to start this in, and I'd love to help you do it. So these are the master, uh, these are the resources. There's a master rain gardener programs that are being through the Clinton and Huron River Watershed Councils. Um, I know if you're familiar with the master gardener program, that's through the uh, uh, Michigan mm -hmm. State uh, ex Extension really good group. We're working with them. We're going to hopefully have them as a partner in this so they can do this. We have thousands of master gardeners all over this county. I'm sure you've got a bunch in yours, in your yep. community. And uh, they'd be a great resource for this. So um, again, the Rain Smart, Rain Smart program, all these different sources are, are, are good. That, and we are here to help any way we can. I know you guys are, are interested in doing the right thing here. We want to do it the most efficient and uh, inexpensive way we can, but something that's going to last a long time. So we're here to help any way we can, and, and whatever questions you had, I'm, I'm happy to answer. Councilmember Sage. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Commissioner Nash, so when will the test program be completed? Well, we're, we were expecting this to take a two, two full years. You know, we thought we'd get maybe 75, 80 people in one year and in the same amount in the other, but we got this huge inundation, so we have a long waiting list. We don't want to keep them waiting. So we're, we're pumping them out as fast as we can. Once, um, you know, end of October, we're going to have to cut off till spring, and then we'll keep pumping them out as fast as we can after that. So we're hoping, we only start out with $200,000. Um, $2,000 per is the max, um, but a bunch of folks have just gotten rain barrels and planted some trees, which that means we can keep going with more folks. But again, if we can get 10 or $15 million for the county, we'll have some funding that we can help you guys use. So that's what we're, what's what we're planning on doing. Mr. Hauser? Sure. You know, I think Mayor Pro Tem, go Mayor ahead. Oh, okay. Thanks. That was very, very informative, and I realize some of the information you provided is a lot to absorb, you know, but at the same time, I think it would be helpful, too, and I'm going to talk to some of my colleagues about the Planning Commission, and I think coming in, I appreciate the residential component, but I think as our city, you know, we don't have a lot of open spaces left, and the spaces that are being used are being developed by larger commercial or, you know, larger scale projects. And I think it would be helpful to see if we could incorporate what you have said here into some of our forward thinking for these larger, you know, condominium projects or apartment, these big footprint type buildings. And so sure. um, I sit on that with the mayor as well. So we'll, I'm going to talk to some people on that. So we may ask you to come back and, and talk to us about some ideas that we could implement from a development standpoint. Hey, taking what you've said, how can we incorporate those into moving forward? So thanks for coming. Oh, we'd be happy to be a resource on that. And I can tell you again, SEMCOG has a great system. Um, they gave us a grant back in 2018 for the GWK, all 14 communities, to look at all their ordinances and all their planning documents to see how they could make in implementing green infrastructure easier. Just things like, you know, um, give them a, a faster processing time if they, if they do certain things. Just there's a bunch of different options that you can do. Um, a lot of communities are doing that kind of thing. Uh, SEMCOG has a program that they can, uh, they have a, a book that you can go through all the areas of your local government and see exactly what the best practices are for that. They're really, that's a good program that you can, they can help you with. Um, and we can help you with that too. My website is oakgov.com slash water. And you just put in there green infrastructure in the search bar and you will get a ton of stuff. Um, all kinds of different resources for that. Uh, you know, we used to have a really hard time getting native plants, but now they're much more common. So you can get them much more easily than you used to. Yes, you so can. So there's lots we can do to help you. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Mayor Pro Tem Salvia. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here and thank you for your information. You know, we, as you said, we have focused a lot of the, on the underground, the pipes and this, and, and so it's important for us to hear about these other initiatives and these other ideas as well as to educate the public. So um, one ask that I would have for the clerk is if we could have your presentation so that it's in the packet online because I don't think it was in the, um, mm -mm. The well, published yeah, packet. Yeah, we just sent it to you today. So yeah, so if we could, it. if we okay. could add that, and I don't know, maybe there's a place on the website just so that people can find it more easily. Um, one takeaway that I heard was thinking about our tree committee, um, and we work for different places in the city where we want to plant trees, and so we've never really thought about it from a stormwater standpoint. So I think maybe that'll be our focus for next year to think about that. Again, so that's thank you. Something that the, the Clinton River Watershed Council can really help you with. They're very good at that kind of planning for green infrastructure, and they can give you. They have a thing where they can give you a tour of green infrastructure installations around this part of the county, and that would be. I think you'd really enjoy that. It would mm, really show you how this kind of thing looks. Really interesting. Thanks, Trent. Well, thank you for coming. Um, it was very, very helpful. I, I was, this was exactly what I was hoping that you would have, and we talked about. But um, also, I, our, I help, will send information to the to the council members about the greening of city zoning codes that Simcog has um, put together, and um, so that when we're looking at our zoning and ordinances coming up, I know that right. we are zoning for sure. That they have put together that information and are sharing it with um, all the cities and municipalities to, for climate resiliency or the flooding issues. Yeah, that's, yes. that's Which the is big basically issue. Basically, it's and we're flooding. getting more and more sophisticated about how we can address it. And and as we do, we're developing these best practices that you guys can implement quite easily now because they've been worked out over time. So mm -hmm. I, I think we're in a good place for that. And again, mm -hmm. we're here to help any way we can. Well, thank you, good. Councilmember King. Yeah, um, I, I really appreciate this. This has been uh, a hot topic for us of discussion um, as we've had a lot of water issues lately. But um, I'm really just curious, and maybe you can speak more to the, um, I think it was the permeable surfaces, like the, I think there was a picture of potentially a driveway or something there. Is there a concern from an environmental standpoint of, you know, additional kind of runoff of oil and gas or other kind of contaminants when you do something like that? or You've, you've always got to be careful of that. The thing is, in, with conventional um, paving, that's even that's a worse issue because there's no place for it to get off of. So it can't, there's no place for it to infiltrate, so it just comes right off. Even things like brake dust, people don't recognize brake dust is something that actually can, mm -hmm. can change the chemistry of small invertebrates and things like that. So... There's a lot to that, but what this does is it allows it to actually infiltrate, but things like that will infiltrate very shallowly into the surface because the surface acts as like its own filter. So it, by the time it gets down any depth, it's, it's pretty much shed all that stuff. So that's the kind of thing that it can help not get into the actual mm -hmm. lakes, rivers, and streams because unless it's a combined system, separated storm drains just go wherever the nearest stream is, and whatever they got in it, it carries it with them. So this kind of helps reduce that, that uh, uh, pollution load off of driveways and even, even roads. Um, but it's, it's becoming more common. Are you seeing, um, so the second part of my question, are you seeing it being adopted in, by communities in residential or commercial zoning ordinances? Absolutely. No, you can do that. You can, you know, there used to be things, well, there's one called parking diets. Um, you know, they, for a long time, the, the rules were in many communities that, if you had 10 square feet, every 10 square feet in a building, you had to have a parking space for. But, you know, you go by most office buildings, and they're very rarely more than, like, a half full. So a lot of communities are putting them on, on, on parking lot diets because mm. the less impervious parking lots you have, the less runoff you have. And in the long run, that's a great way of, of approaching that. Plus, people use bioswales, you know, the, the hump with a carp, with a, with a you mm -hmm. know, curb around it and a half-dead tree in parking lots. <laughs> you just make it a, a bioswale instead of a hump because the hump just sheds that water just like, like I said, mm -hmm. after the first mm -hmm. little bit of rain, it just sheds that like, like concrete. And if you have it gathered there and you still have the, the entry of the storm drain at the, at the surface of the driveway, it, it, it has to while before it gets to that to that storm drain. So those kind of things can be done. Green roofs can be done. All those things can be done um, when you're, especially when you're doing the original building of a building, it costs a lot less because you're not having to mm -hmm. rebuild anything. You're just building it to the new specs. So there's a lot of potential there. Okay, Thank you. 
Councilmember Trent? Uh, yes, I would just like to add that when people, the, the, what I find talking about rain gardens with people, they're like, oh, well, that sounds nice. But basically the statistics I have read are that uh, rain, a rain, uh, just a typical smaller sized rain garden can soak up to 5,000 gallons of water with one inch rain. So okay. that, not your yard, it's a, it's a small size, it's five or 700 square feet. Right. That's Basically. No, it's true. And like I said, the That's new technologies, soaks, they're, little, yeah. they're little like almost like straws that they can put down 30, 40 feet in the ground, and it pulls mm -hmm, that down. It does. And I've actually, in a drought, it pulls water up because it's, it, it's always want to equalize. But um, that's that there are so many new technologies coming out mm -hmm. that can make it much smaller areas, and you can have a lot more infiltration. Yeah, so, the, and that's what you guys need. I mean, that's how I hear this. So, because yeah. you have a lot of impervious surfaces, and you need you need to, to direct them to places that can imperv you know, perk down in the ground, but rather than just collect in somebody's driveway or, you know, something like that. So. Yep. 90% more than grass. That's how, it's so, that's how much it soaks up. But anyway, Councilman thank Jones. you very much. Oh. I just want to first thank you for coming. This is all new information to absorb for us, but also want to thank Council Member Trent for asking you to come. Um, so thank, thank you. you. This, is, this is good to process. I'd love to come back <laughs> if I can, you know, I can, I'm always here to help, whatever I can do. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you, Commissioner, for coming. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you now. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next, we have the quarterly financial presentation. Is that Marcy? Come the deputies on. are all being fully deployed tonight. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. If, if I can work the computer now. You can just hit the minimize. Do it. The this minimize one? button. This one? Yep, click that and then minimize. Quarterly. There we go. Thank goodness. All right. <laughs> Sorry for the delay. No worries. Okay. So tonight we're presenting the city's pre-audit results for the fourth quarter fiscal year ending 2024. We're pleased to present the highlights for council and the public. This report contains a lot of numbers and a lot of information, so it might be a little easier if I break it down in this the screens that I'm showing you are in a little bit of a different order than what was in your packet. So I'll begin with the general fund. The general fund is our primary operating fund. It supports essential services, police, fire, department, public works, and administration, and it plays a central role in the financial budgeting and management and attracts it's our, our way of tracking revenue and expenditures to ensure transparency and fiscal stability. So how's the city's general fund doing? As we concluded the 2024 um, budget cycle, revenues totaled $16.8 million, exceeding the budgeted amount by 2%. Uh, key contributors are property tax, medical, reimbursement for ambulance runs, and administrative cross charges. Expenditures were managed well. I'll go to the expenditure page. Expenditures were also managed well, coming in at $16.8 million, with the largest expenses being wages, contractual services, health insurance, and it slightly exceeded the initial forecast. So these details, more, more of these details and on the other funds are included in the snapshot page of the report, so you can look at that at your leisure. Um, but I'll, I'll move on to our requested budget um, amendments. So budget amendments allow organizations to adjust the financial plans as circumstances change throughout the fiscal year. And it helps us improve our financial accuracy in planning. So in this list are uh, several carryovers from fiscal year ending 24 to the budget cycle we're in now, fiscal year ending uh, 2025. Those carryovers um, most notably are Bridge maintenance at $234,000, parking platform maintenance at $24,500, and parking gate equipment at $44,000. So 
So these began, some of these projects began in 24, we're continuing them on in 25, and we're asking council to approve the movement of those line items into our current budget cycle because we'll make our payment for those projects in our current year. <clears throat> the amendments also reflect changes in the legislator, legislative requirements and project delays. Some, some things just didn't kick off as we had planned, so we make a little bit of adjustments through the amendment process. So radio and E911 upgrades that had 69,000 allocated, that's driven by the equipment availability from Oakland County and the timing of its delivery. So that's on the list as well. And then there's city and DPW and park projects of 84,000 that are carrying over upgrades and maintenance, some of which include the DPW's garage door replacement and some park building upgrades. So at the end, we'll ask if you have any questions about those, and if not, we'll ask for your approval for those amendments requested. So the next section in the report is our investment. Um, investment balances at the end of June 30th totaled $27.1 million, primarily in money market and pooled investment accounts, averaging a, a healthy 5% return on investment, with fund balances remaining stable. Debt management we always like to look at and call attention to. The city's on track with our long-term obligations, including our bonds to Oakland County, Mr. Nash <laughs> and others, <laughs> Oakland <laughs> County, Macomb Interceptor, pension and parking bonds, um, and principal payments and interests are being made as scheduled. Um, as you move through the report, you'll see performance indicators, green meaning on track, yellow meaning monitor, and red meaning a call for action. So as you can see, most departments and projects are on track uh, with a few marked for monitoring due to project timing and legislative changes. For example, um, deliveries of vehicles have been delayed from the manufacturer. That's something that we're monitoring, but that may present a need for a budget amendment in the future. So the last is our notable um, observations. I'm going to scroll back to the snapshot page. I think that's it. Yes. <clears throat> so the, when you look at the different funds that we're reporting here, one may stand out, the Drug Law Enforcement 265 Fund. I, I don't know how to make it big on here, but it is... Um, right there let's it is. see. So 265, so it's coming in at 161% of budget. So we'll call attention to that because um, that is related to opioid settlements that have come back to the city as part of legal settlements from the op opioid manufacturers and distributors. We, we don't budget for those, they come in a little bit piecemeal, but it is um, important and those settlements aim to compensate communities for their costs associated with the opioid crisis, such as health care and public safety expenses. The city uses these funds to address the impact of the opioid crisis. So overall, we're proud to report that the city's maintained a balanced approach to revenue generation and expenditure management, allowing us to continue our capital improvement without significant deficits. We remain dedicated to serving our residents and the businesses within our community. And this report highlights the key financial metrics, budget amendments, and project updates, and the overall city's finan uh, financial and fiscal health. So if you have any questions, I'll be glad to address those. Council. Council Member Jones. Can you just address, um, looking at the percentages, uh, when I looked at home, the brownfield redevelopment as well as the capital projects line items. Okay, so the brownfield, this one is, uh, we don't, we don't really budget for this because this is driven by the developers turning into us of quarterly reports. So it's determined by their actions um, for reimbursement from Eagle. So it is off, off um, considerably, but it is one that we don't pay too much attention to because it, it's a no cost to the city. The, whatever gets charged, we get reimbursed for. So it is, in the end, it will be a wash, 
um, but so that's why it's it's a it looks out of out of whack it's a on projection, that projection. But you really don't correct. Know until, correct. Okay, correct. that makes sense. Yeah. And then the capital projects one. The four ninety nine. Yep. So four ninety nine is a fund that we are mm-hmm. we're not using as much anymore. What goes into four ninety nine are really park bench sales and um, what else? Uh, sundial, sundial bricks. Um, it's it's not used as much because we try to uh, budget and and expend in different forms than the four ninety nine fund. So we do have some fund balance in that but we're shifting it out. It's mainly Sundial, Park Bench. Okay. It's, it's, uh, it okay. has very little activity anymore. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. Council, sure. Mayor Pro Tem. Sure. Sure. Thank you, Marcy. Wonderful pre- presentation, very understandable. Mm-hmm. You make you know complex numbers. Uh, <laughs> our budgeting process is um, very robust and you made, you made it sound uh, simple and easy to understand. Thank you, Good. thank you. Um, I was one just small little thing I noted there was the ambulance services. I know Chief has worked hard on that, so I was happy to see that 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 revenue remains steady. That's really good, Um, you know, as well as the income coming in from our money markets and CDs. You know, interest rates are likely going down, so um, we've we've enjoyed it. We've enjoyed getting five percent. That's wonderful. um, also, clearly, we all understand that this really is kind of the accounting process where projects we've already approved mm-hmm. and what you're asking us to approve is just really the accounting to catch up with um, that. So I would make a motion to approve the uh, requested um, budget amendments um, as shown in our packet on page five. Motion by Mayor Pro Tem, Sup- support by Council Member Hauser. Discussion? Mr. Clerk, the roll, please. Bixon? Yes. Salvia? Yes. Hauser? Yes. Jones? Yes. King? Yes. Sage? Yes. Trent? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you, yes. Very detailed. Thank you. Yep, thank you. That was a good job. Favorite part of the meeting. (laughs) (laughs) Especially when it's good good news, it's a favorite part of the meeting. That's right. Exactly. Um, It's when it's done. Are there further public comment? This is no. Carrie. This is when you. Yeah, yeah. Welcome. Hi. I'm Carrie Briskin. I live on Wilcox. And I came here today to kind of bring um, some attention to the properties between Madison and Wilcox off a of university on the north, the north side, the south, north side. Um, they have been, one has been torn down, that would be 510 University. And you currently have properties at 532, um, 524, which is the apartment above uh, 532, 520, and 516. Um, they are all owned by a Jean uh, Sitko, who currently, uh, for the last 15 years, has been living in Grand Junction, Colorado. Um, the houses have gone. Um, in the 20-something years that I've lived here, they've deteriorated, especially since the State Farm moved out of that building. Um, We see, on a regular basis, um, cars pulling in and out, high-end cars. Um, They will pull into the parking lot, someone will walk out, and the cars will leave. Um, Clearly, kind of drug deals. Um, There have been SWAT raids at the house, particularly 532. Um, Police have been called, um, and I did talk to the police chief, um, and he indicated that some of those have been welfare checks. There is a colorful individual that is currently living in the apartment at 524. Um, But I am a property owner um, myself. I'm a a landlord in several, several cities. I'm a real estate agent and an investor. I have several investors that I work with again, in other cities around Oakland and Macomb counties. And typically, um, from my experience, people who own landlord licenses are held to a different standard in terms of house maintenance than someone who just lives at the home. I know several of my houses, if the lawn isn't mowed within a certain, I have a citation that my, my tenants are getting. And so... Cities are typically on renters' cases, and 
I think it's sad, especially when I just paid my tax bill, to see these homes in this area deteriorating and nothing seems to be done. There, there is a car parked in the 532 lot that's been there for probably eight years. It has two flat tires and it's, you know, it, it's inoperable. And we've called the city, and I know he was somebody who was supposed to check on that today, but we've been told just because they renew the license plate that there's nothing that can be oh done about gosh. it. So I guess I'm asking for maybe there be some attention paid to how we manage our rental properties in the city um, and maybe some more steps being taken to um, hold, especially out-of-state landlords accountable to whom they're renting their properties to. Because, I mean, you go, f I mean, I'm in this first section of Wilcox, but you go to, um, you know, north of 7th Street, and it's a completely different area. But because, I mean, I'm sitting there with, I, I back up to a lot of these rental properties, you know, I, I feel that, you know, it kind of does a disservice to the home that I'm maintaining and renovating um, when I have to look at this kind of stuff on a regular basis. So that's why I'm here today. Thank you, Mr. City Attorney. I mean, is there, you know, does that fall I mean, into our normal I mean, procedures? If they're, if, they're, if they're blight issues, then uh, I know the uh, fire department who handles the, uh, I, I'm not aware of, Specifically, I know 510 University, but that was that was being prosecuted, and that's obviously torn down. Um, but I don't know specific addresses on on University off the it's top. It's the of only head. remaining houses that are there between Madison mm -hmm. and Wilcox. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and maybe maybe Mr. City Attorney, that kind of falls into our trying to strengthen some of these things that you were you know going to come back to us at some future date on. Sure, and right now, if they're brought to the city's attention, I know the fire department, I mean, I'm, I'm working on a lot of blight cases and a lot of them dealing with, with uh, rental properties. Um, that, is, that is an issue. Um, I don't know if we can uh, legislate who they rent to, um, but as far as the property maintenance, I, I know our fire department is very responsive to people who raise concerns about that. Um, so I, 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 think I guess there's something more I can say at this point. Chief has an update right. on some of this. Councilmember Hauser, do you have a comment? I, I do, just very quickly. And, and Ms. Briskin, thanks for bringing that to our attention. If you've watched any of the meetings over the past several months, you know that this is an issue that is discussed regularly. And unfortunately, I, I seem to bring it up a lot, and it's okay. But I want you and other residents to understand that this is something that we take very seriously, and we're working with our city attorney to come up with some modifications and enhancements to our existing blight ordinances. So these these properties that you've referenced, and those aren't the only ones, okay? Mm -hmm. There's several around town that seem to kind of fall through the cracks and it tend to be a little bit, well, we're not sure. We're looking to strengthen our, our, our blight ordinance. So yeah. there's no question that those conditions that you present, if a car has a flat tire for eight years, that ought not to be there. If a house is in dilapidated condition, it's just not maintained, there needs to be something done. So I'm, I'm representing to you that we're working with our city attorney to try and come up with some language that's gonna address those issues sooner rather than later. Okay. If I could add to that, um, 604 University. So that was a property um, last year. So it, it was sold. It's the, house, it's the house adjacent to Bob Bloomingdale's old building. Um, Bob had some kind of backdoor arrangement with this new owner that they could um, cut through his parking lot and build a parking lot behind that property that faces university. Didn't pull permits. One day, all of a sudden, the backyard's being excavated and a you know cement truck is there. Um, oh sounds like the, a stormwater problem. <laughs> well, it does. And thankfully, the police were responsive and came out and shut them down. But myself and my neighbors, what we look at now is a backyard that has, you know, dirt piled high and it's not mowable. And so every Friday morning at 6.45 a.m., the lawn crew comes with a weed whacker because that's the only way to mow that back property. Um, that because, you know, again, no, mo no permits Tyrant were pulled gold. to allow a parking lot to be built with the proper drainage system. And because of that, his employees now park on Wilcox. And so they're taking up spaces on Wilcox 
because he only has a driveway to allow accommodate. So this was all because of a backdoor deal between Bob and this new owner that's kind of caused all of this with, with that home. So just add that to your, <laughs> your house addresses. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, uh, Chief, Thank you. Yeah. Chief, Thank do you. you have a comment? I just stick my two cents in. <laughs> I survived Art and Ample's. Yeah. Um, one first. thing I want to say is I notice a lot of people, they don't want to call the police. They think they're bothering us. And if you don't call, it didn't happen. If you were assaulted and you don't call us, it never happened. We have to put it on paper. If you have a house where you think there's drug activity or there's maybe an abandoned car, please call us. That's what we get paid to do, and we enjoy doing it. Uh, for instance, I talked to uh, Carrie today, and she brought up the, uh, the vehicle over there. It's already tagged. Ten days, and it's, it's getting towed out of there. The owner's been notified. He doesn't move it in ten days. It's in briefing to keep special attention on that property. And there's a lot of properties that we, we go around town. It's, you know, it's not really blight. It may be something that we're, maybe we don't agree with the colors they've selected, or maybe we don't like the landscaping that's not necessarily blight. There's not much we can do. However, this uh, one residence that we're, we spoke about today, I did take photos today. And I submitted it to the fire department to have them. Maybe they can uh, look at certain blight issues they may have there. And another issue is we have so many complaints over there. We've responded there 15 times maybe in the last uh, six months. I think it's time to uh, maybe contact the owner of the property out in Colorado, you know, um, Maybe the city can send a letter or a city attorney saying, hey, listen, this is what's going on there. I mean, I'm, I'm used to dealing with ordinances where you, it was three strikes and out. If you rented a house and we had to re, uh, respond to your home for certain certain things three times in one month, you were evicted. That's wow. what we did. Or we did a cost recovery. If we went there on certain things, the same things, drunk and disorderly assaults, you got charged for our services the police car and the number of officers or even the fire department to go there those are just some things that some options you, you have I don't know if we want to go that way but there's certain places in town here that uh, we constantly all the resources are going to them and it's not fair for the other residents because it's tying up our officers time mm -hmm. and we need to be out in the streets patrolling so that's just something to think about but my thing is if when in doubt call us you're not bothering us I'll be more than happy to look into it and we already accomplished a lot on this, and I think you're going to get some results in the next few weeks. So. Oh, well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, wow, thank you. great. Thanks. All right. Thank you. thank you. Okay. Any further public comment? Is Brian, is Megan? Is there anybody up there? Megan? No one. Okay, thank you. Um, next on to approval of the minutes is consideration of the minutes of the regular meeting of August 26, 2024. I don't think they yeah, were, we in were, they were, they were in there. They were not there. in there. I don't believe. Okay, we will table that to the next meeting. Uh, there's nothing on the consent agenda. There's no old business or table items. There are no public hearings tonight. First is the legislative deliberation. Public hearing and first reading and introduction zoning code section 800-RM1 intent. Mr. City Attorney. Yes, thank you. Uh, before you uh, is the, uh, we're set for a public hearing today at uh, your August uh, 12 meeting. We did set this for the required public hearing since it is a zoning ordinance. The only change that's proposed is to remove the last sentence of uh, section 800 uh, sub A, um, which is removing some language that uh, that was deemed to be confusing and yet uh, unnecessary. And so this went through Planning Commission, and it went to City Council, and this is set for a, a public hearing. So the requested action is to um, conduct the public hearing and move it to first reading introduction. Very good. Is there any questions before we open the public hearing? Okay, at 8.05, we will open the public hearing. Any comments? We'll close the public hearing at 8.05. Council discussion. Council Member Jones. Um, my my question or thought about this is, um, since you are going to be starting the master plan and looking at all the zoning, and this is going to be worked on, I'm not sure that I agree with 
making one change now when it's all going to be looked at. Um, it seems like this was prompted, correct me if I'm wrong, from the Solaronics project and a citizen having an issue with the word intent being in there. Um, so my thought is let's wait when we're looking at all of this and looking at the master plan and all the zoning and do it all at one time. Very good. Further comments? Is there a... Oh, can I get your way? Uh, just a little bit. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> you, you know, it's okay. Um, yeah, so when it was at planning, could you refresh my memory? Was was the planning, was that a, um, a full vote that everyone agreed upon the, to change it? Well, I, th I think those were the two arguments. Is, But I think I think there it was not unanimous. Mm -hmm. That's what uh, the first vote... And then I think it was unanimous to bring it to city council. Correct. So there was two votes. One wasn't unanimous, and then the vote to move it to city council. Oh, was oh gotcha. Unanimous. Okay. Um, so uh, we are going to be looking at all of the zoning and and the, the, and, and the ordinance and the master plan. So yeah, I mean, is that soon though? I'm hoping it's soon, right? I mean, I, <laughs> well, I think I think the planning, Define soon. the planning, the planning commission has committed to trying to get it done by the first of the year. Is that yeah? To then bring to council. Yeah, but it's 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 a long, laborious process. As mm -hmm. you understand, and, yeah, and got. council person King, who was on planning commission as well, it's it's in the process, but it's glacial pace. And now we've got this other, you know, uh, when I was talking about green, doing, looking at the climate resiliency as well, so we're doing a, really a, a major overhaul. The other thing is, is our intent to fix this <laughs> or this, this, this uh, that was brought up, uh, this uh, statement that was brought up by this sentence of in, what the meaning of intent is that my understanding will be looking at that. Is it, that so just yeah, that's just part of what we'll be looking at. Yeah. yeah. I, I think the argument was, I think it was unanimous that people felt like this should probably be taken out. But I think the, our, the debate was, do you do it now or do you wait until you have the whole okay. thing? So that, that was the debate. I would concur. Yeah, it was, there was no question that that particular line item issue needed to be resolved. Mm -hmm. And it was mm -hmm. a function of now versus then. I think the, the sense of urgency to do it now was only because it was raised by some discussions at the Solaronics, and more importantly, they wanted to remove any doubt whatsoever. And I don't think it was isolated to this one. It was just that project happened to be in front of the council or planning commission at that particular time. So they said, let's deal with it then, recognizing, though, that there's going to be a wholesale modification and review of yeah. the master plan and all these ordinances. That's my recollection based on having yeah. attended those meetings. Well, I don't know. I would attend. Council Member Sage. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So do we have any understanding, Oz, the, the city administration, um, based on this, has this delayed any potential sale of that property? I, I, no. No. Um, I mean, the project, I mean, there's a, this, this change has nothing to do with that project. So okay. that was, that, that project was approved with the current language this came in afterwards and there was discussion of what does it even mean you know like what does that language even mean and we don't know the history of why that language was put in there uh, speaking with the planner they ran it through the planning to their planners and don't know why that would be in there but if it created confusion for one um, um, we disagreed with the interpretation of of the resident but when we couldn't find we couldn't justify reason to keep it in there um, uh, in fact, city, the discussion was at city council as well as we, we said that this is the next action we would take is to, is to remove it. So uh, while I, I agree that there's going to be um, changes, I, I don't know if there's a reason to, to stop this process for this, for this change. It's obviously city council's uh, you know, uh, choice whether to proceed with it. There's really two more steps. One is tonight and one would be the next city council meeting for second reading and adoption and then that is is up there there's, there'd be no reason to keep this in whatever changes come down come down the way so um it's up to city council for sure but uh yeah 
Mayor Pro Tem Salvia. Thank you. Um, from my perspective, um, I feel like we've come this far. Um, and I, I'm remembering a time being here on council where there was some question about a, a zoning change and whether we should make that one tweak or should we wait for the more major revision that was coming. And then I remember it caused a whole bunch of problems later down the road because we didn't make that decision earlier. So I'm feeling like at this point in time, we should, I'd like to make a motion to move this uh, ordinance amendment for the first reading and Fair introduction. Me. Motion by Mayor Pro Tem Salvia. Support. Is there support? The support by Council Member King and then discussion Council Member King yeah so for me I, I, I remember this on planning I was involved and then also on, on council um, I think that it's it's confusing it um, is directly contradicting what the actual ordinance is and I, I don't see a reason for for keeping it in there was no history of why it would be in there so I think cleaning up now just makes it easier I do think we need to address because we did add in with the most recent master plan, we added in new zoning um, areas that are that don't have an ordinance yet. So there is work to be done because we can't even use those new classifications yet. Um, and I would like to really see that get forward. I know planning was down a couple of people and that was kind of the reason for the slowdown. But now that we have planning fully staffed, it sounds like it should be able to continue with that process. But I know that process will be long and slow. Right. So I, I would prefer that we go ahead and just um, clean this up now. Councilmember Jones. So I am not in support of that, but I don't quite understand this process. I need clarification of moving it to the next. Do so, I vote no now so, so. or do I wait to vote no well, when the, it's read on the final reading? You, you can, you can vote both. Either, either or both. both. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, That's all I need to know before we voted. Further discussion? Dixon? Uh... <laughs> Uh, no. Salvia? Yes. Hauser? Yes. Jones? No. King? Yes. Sage? Yes. Trent? No. Okay, so we move it to second reading and adoption. Okay. Next is a report of regular business consideration of a resolution regarding the DDA parcel tax base year adjustment. Council, uh, Mr. City Attorney. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Before you is a, a rather unusual uh, situation <laughs> um, involving the uh, uh, elevator granary project. As City Council knows, the project was adopted or approved and things were going down the path. Uh, one of the uh, criteria or one of the conditions of approval was from the city's perspective was that the, the there's two parcels and I put a map in the uh, in there which I hope was helpful um, just to kind of show that it's a diagonal line um, that uh, is needed for both uh, or for the parcels to be developed so one of the criteria was to combine them mm -hmm. so that's ver that's very standard so we get a uh, communication from the developer saying that uh, hey we submitted the paperwork to try to get the the property parcels combined the two lots um, but Oakland County could not process that because the two parcels came into the DDA at different years. And I'm not going to read, I mean, hopefully that was my memo was, I, I tried to put a lot of information in there. <coughs> so it took yeah. quite a while to figure out a solution to this apparent problem. And so it, it's, it deals with the tax year and the calculation of tax capture. Um, so we came up, and this was uh, working with the county, this is not something that they've uh, addressed. Like they, they didn't know a path forward. Other, so we kind of were, were, were fixing the plane as we're flying it type thing. So what we came up with was um, they suggested if the 1983 parcel was recalculated as a 1995 parcel for tax capture purposes, they get a new tax base year then they would be on the same tax base year and therefore they could do the combination. So I mean, there's a lot more discussion that, that occurred getting to that point. And so we're trying to figure out pros, cons, what's the negatives. And so we, the only negative that uh, we, could, we could see was that the, there would be a reset on the capture year for one of the, parcel, one of the two parcels from 83 to, to 95. And so we figured out, in fact, I think Anthony calculated, it's literally like $1,000. Um, 
And so what we wanted to do was to make sure everyone understood it. So we actually went to the um, uh, DDA because the tax capture, uh, it, it, this process will only, I'll say, hurt or cost the DDA $1,000 versus taking it out of, you know, another option was taking it completely out of the DDA, which would deal with boundaries and, and so forth. And that, was, that would be quite a large undertaking. So we went to DDA, explained it to them. They were like, they see the light at the end of the tunnel which is hopefully a full developed property because then the tax capture will just be, because there's really not a whole lot of tax capture because it's, it, you know, because the property is what it is at the moment. So they were in full support and they actually made a motion to express to city council that they were in support of this and to essentially a little step back in capture to get a full step forward um, and then some. So the action that we're looking for today is I put together a resolution and I ran this by the county just to say, if city council approves this, will you then combine the lots like we're requiring and the developer's financer? That's the, the part I just left out, of course, which is important, which the financing company said, or the bank said, you need to get these combined because we can't do this. So, um, so there's, from our perspective, we want it done. From the lender's perspective, they want it done. Developer just wants to get going on their project, and this is holding up their project. So this, this uh, proposed resolution goes through that history and merely says, you know, it's a lot of whereas is, but then it gets resolved of that uh, city council does approve a changing of the tax base year of parcel ending 009 from 1983 uh, with a parcel, you know, I put the tax code in there, uh, to having a tax base year of 1995 with a tax billing code of 68-D1-ROCH-1995. That's all the county's code and how they're calculating tax capture. So that's the, that's the request of the action. Um, I'm not sure if there's any questions on that. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Um, you said that the county would approve this and that the county would then 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 approve this and that the Councilmember King. Just one quick question. So you said it would have a negative impact on the DDA, about $1,000. Does that just shift? Does the overall tax capture stay the same and it shifts that to the city versus the DDA? Or do they actually pay slightly less in taxes based no. on the current? This has zero impact on the developer at all. So really what it is, they still pay the same tax bill just less goes to the DDA and more goes to the other taxing authorities, including the city, yeah. minimally. But it, the city will actually get a slight increase in taxes as well as the county um, and the other taxing authorities. They all will get a slight bump. So, you know, when we talk to the developer, they're like, we're, we're trying to figure out a problem that we just, it's not our issue. It is their issue because they want to develop it, but they're paying the same taxes regardless. This has zero impact on negative impact on the developer. No increase in tax, no decrease in tax. So we don't get the full pickup, part of it goes to the county or other correct. tax increase. Correct, correct. Okay, yeah. correct. But, but there is some net pickup to us. Correct, yeah. correct. <coughs> Council Member Jones. This isn't maybe an attorney question, but um, is this what has held up this project proceeding? That, that's what they've indicated to us, is that because I've really, heard different they stories of what's held it up. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of engineering stuff that happens. That's what I've heard. Okay. So there, this is one of the things. And okay. so we've been told uh, that this is really kind of holding up because they can't get the financing until the lots are combined, and they can't get do the lots combined until we take this action. Okay. So it, there's some dominoes for sure. Right. This is not the only domino. But okay, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. If we, if we pass this, no more excuses. One, one more down, no <laughs> gone, that's Great. all. <laughs> yeah. Councilmember Trent. Yeah, I was at the DDA meeting, and this all sounded like a great solution yeah. to, a, yeah. to a problem that just cropped out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, so, so I would make a motion. Motion by Councilmember Trent. Mm -hmm. Approve changing the tax. Support. support by the Mayor Pro Tem Salvia. Further discussion? Mr. Clerk, the roll, please. Bixon. Yes. Salvia? Yes. Hauser? Yes. Jones? Yes. King? Yes. Sage? Yes. Trent? Yes. Thank you, Council. Thank you. So that's that's all we need to do. The, yes, that, that we'll now get this, uh, this resolution to the county and give them the green light to combine. 
Shovels will be there tomorrow. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Get it ready. <laughs> They've got some clean ones. I just used a lamp wafer. All right, going. next, next um, uh, agenda item B. Um, Mr. City Attorney, we are going to table to the next meeting. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Okay, next is a receipt of the check register report. Any comments, questions? If not, oh. on to reports. I did. I'm uh, sorry. Councilmember King. I did have a question. I just have to pull it up real quick again. Um, there was a larger expense that I just wanted to ask about. Um, Oh, the, it was, um, oh, and um, the fire chief isn't here tonight, but I just didn't remember this being in, like, one of the capital items that we <coughs> approved, and maybe it's just in the regular budget, but there was the new ambulance cardian monitors. Was that, do you recall that being part of Is that the $112,000 line item? There was 112, well, there's three line items yeah. for it, 15, 112, 17. Mr. Uh, Treasurer? Recall, like, yes, yeah, we... that uh, came to City Council. Uh, I believe that's a typo in it. It's the cardiac monitors. Uh, oh, that's right, that's where we right. came to we Council and asked yeah. approval at the okay. uh, first yep. meeting in July. So that's yep. it. Cardio. And the way they so do the billing is they don't bill you until they start shipping it. So it ends up being these broken, oh, this chunk of the order, here's your bill. Oh, now the next chunk came. Here's the bill for that. And that's why you see them broken up like that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Further comments, questions? Okay. Next is a report from the various boards and commission. First is a report from the Planning Commission. Council Member Hauser. Sure. Okay. So at the Planning Commission meeting that was held on September 3rd, there was um, several public hearings. One of them was for 114 uh, 4th Street, which was the one item that we just tabled. That's for parking in lieu. There's an agreement that the city and um, the uh, business are, have entered into. There's a development 1120 North Main, a public hearing. That was a modification of an existing building. They're going to tear it down, and it was going to be office. They're going to convert it to residential in a uh, second story. They talked about the proposed development at the former School of Rock building. There's a public hearing for that. And then there was another public hearing for the development at the former Moon River uh, property where the developers came in, presented to the Planning Commission their ideas, their concepts. They're going to go back and make some further modifications and changes to those plans. And then finally, we had uh, one final parking in lieu. I think it was one spot for the, the coffee shop over on 2nd Street over there. Uh, but other than that, those were the uh, projects before Planning Commission on September 3rd, Mr. Mayor. Questions? Council Member King? Um, th maybe this is more for Attorney Crot. I know, I think in the past, we've been advised that City Council shouldn't attend planning meetings. But... What if we have a view on, like, as a community member, I had a view on one of those projects, the aesthetics of it. What's the best way for us to be able to still express our views as, you know, residents in the community? Sure. Yeah, there's a, there's multiple factors of why not to show. One, you, you run into quorum type issues or close to quorum issues, then it would be a city council. Because there's already two city council members on that. So mm -hmm. um, that's one thing. The, the other concern is... Um, uh, does that you being a city council member exert more pressure uh, if you say your position on something? Um, does a planning commission member who you appoint, do they feel like they shouldn't go with you because that? So that's the, the back story of why we, we don't love extra city council members being there. I can't tell you not to go, um, but that's we've encouraged you not to. If there's a, I, I know that uh, written communication um, is probably the best way to, to pass that on, um, whether it's to the, the, the planning commission in general or to a, an individual saying someone said this. So, I mean, you can, it doesn't have to be mysterious or anonymous, but I, I, that's less of an impact, less of a concern to me if, if, if you're resident, you know, don't say this is city, you know, as a city council member, I'm saying this, but if you're just, if you're a resident acting as a resident, you do not lose your voice. Um, so if you would like to present that, I would encourage it to be in a, a written versus showing up. Okay. And also isn't, we're, we're the liaisons to the council, so you can right. let that's right. um, us know. Office hours. Yeah. It's not yeah. No, and that's, and that's, and that's, and that's really, think, right? and, that, and that's kind of Seriously. where I was going, is, it, is yeah. if, Seriously. if city council members yeah. do have something they want to pass through, and that's what all our boards, you know, with right. liaisons to all these things, that's, those are important, but... 
if it's your own position, not a city council position. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think we want to hear what. Oh, absolutely, one hundred percent. We and want I, that input. And I, I do. Council members. And I think it's very important. <laughs> yeah. So. And I think on that topic, I've Didn't heard from every city. Yeah. <laughs> Officer. The secret's out, yes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Don't look directly at us. Hi. Nice to meet you. Hi. Have you been, do you hear from me no. once in a while? Who's this? No. New phone, who's this? Yeah. yeah. So I just add for New that one. one a resident. The, the one, uh, the uh, soap building, um, you know, we've asked them to come back and, and things, and we'll, we'll see if they do. Right. One of the important things to remember, though, is that the Planning Commission doesn't have the ability to just summarily reject a proposal because they don't like it, the, the style or the color or the materials. We don't have a standards. We don't have, you know, an, uh, a committee that bases it on historical preservation or anything like that. As long as it conforms to height, setback, zoning, you know, all those types of, of requirements that our laws, you know, our ordinance mandate, then the Planning Commission can obviously give its thoughts, its comments, its suggestions, but at the end of the day, we just can't say no because we don't like something. If it conforms with the use and the ordinances, your hands are tied, and you get into trouble when you say no, even though it checks all the boxes. Right. But I think that's ex absolutely correct. Yes. Um, this project they are asking for yes. parking concessions. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. exactly which, right. Which in theory, we can't say no to the building, but we could say no That's, to the parking. You're concessions absolutely correct. Yes, as well. Mm -hmm. um, That's right. Councilmember Jones. And that that was what I was going to talk to. And I think that um, maybe I need to do research outside of um, a meeting. But um, I would love a more understanding about that purchasing of parking spots because that seems to really be coming to play. And a lot of the developers that are building downtown right now, and I've had some questions by community members about that. So I don't know it's an if issue. we talk about it at a meeting or if we just do a little tutorial. The parking the meeting. Yeah. 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 So. And they're, I think they're asking for 30. 30. Yeah. Largest Which seems ever. like a, an awful lot. Largest too. ever. Too. Yes. Actually, no. it, the largest no, ever was, was the Roxy. Was the Roxy. The Roxy. 67. Oh, yeah. Which got 67. So which, yeah. uh, 67. Council member came. <laughs> Yes. Um, will the will the parking in lieu of those rates be part of the master fee schedule that we're going to be looking at? No. Uh, no, 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 they are not on there. That's a no, separate. Not, that's we separate. talk about that when we talk about our parking system and the, the money coming in and the cost of it and any adjustments we need to make. Um, Mayor, is that I don't really think that's like regularly scheduled. It's the parking committee. I know we no. reduced it pretty significantly. Oh, it used right. to be yes. seventy five hundred dollars. Oh, yeah. 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 Fifteen thousand. Oh, and then it went yeah. okay, seventy five to one thousand. One thousand. So I just don't know if that's something that needs to be revisited, especially in light of kind of the status of our parking right. situation. Yeah. The I think you know, and you can make all these different right, arguments. Please. You know, they don't use it during the day; they use it at night. The Roxy uses it at night, not during the. Yeah, you know, there's all ways to look at it, but we are granting those concessions. Yeah, so, Trent? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, how many times can you sell a parking spot? Like, can we sell, like, maybe there's One more time. Right? <laughs> three to one? Is it three to one? I mean, you get, yeah, how, I I mean we look at how many we've sold. I mean, maybe we've already oversold and we're out, out of parking Mayor spots. Pro Tem, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe, you know, parking is always such a great topic. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to just mayor calendar at some point in time in the next six months we have some sort of parking system update, you know, what's happening with the system, usage, revenues coming in, uh, compliance, yeah. everything. Yeah. And if and we want to talk about it, if we want to make any changes, we can. Maybe, Anthony, it's time for a parking committee. <laughs> yes. Parking tutorial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilmember Jones. Just one other comment then. So if it goes through planning commission, and this is just logistics that I'm not aware of, and they approve of an extra 30, 60, 70, City Council has no say in that, correct? correct? on this one. It's correct. a done deal through planning. Well, we approve the parking in lieu. Well, that's right. what I'm asking. No. I, don't, I don't think so on this one, uh, Mr. No. City Attorney. So the Planning Commission has the authority to grant the payment in lieu of parking. If they want to Sorry, uh, spread it out over time, the payments over time, that's when it would come to City Council. Mm -hmm. So if they paid it, let's say there was 30, 
30 spaces and they wanted to stroke a check for $30,000, right. it wouldn't come here because they're not asking for an extension uh, or a, right. a payment plan. But you, they, it would typically come to council if they want a special exception. Right. And special on this exception. one, they're not asking for a special exception. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, next, we have the principal shopping district, Councilmember Jones. Okay. Um, I'm going to read from my notes, actually, from Christy. Um, Chris Kringle Market, um, Taylor updated the board that they received over 100 applications so far for Chris Kringle. And Chris Kringle is going to be on 12-6 uh, from 4 to 10 and 12-7 from 12 to 10. Um, they have requested closure on parts of Walnut that they have not asked for in the past. So 4th Street, Walnut, they want some space on Walnut. Uh, they review. Okay, they reviewed the expansion map. Um, the chief has that expansion map, I guess, and they're asking for assistance. They voted um, unanimously to recommend approval of the event proposed to city council. Christie reported that the Festival of Trees is going well, with item donation commitments already exceeding 2023. The presenting sponsor of this year's event is Merrill Lynch, Nancy Salvia. Uh, the big bright light show installation begins at the end of the month. Um, this year's holiday window decorating contest theme is Winter Wonderland. Taste of Fall features 43 items this year, and the fall holiday marketing kits were distributed, and we are receiving a great response. That's it. Okay. That's very good. Thank you. I had a question. Sure. That's when we're stage. So on the expansion of the Chris Kringle Market onto Walnut, you're kind of limited there, right? So you can't block the parking structure to the north. Right. Can't block the funeral home to the south. So how much are they looking for, I guess? Do you know, Chief? They're going to go up to the parking structure to the driveway. So the, the traffic would just flow north. They can come in, they can come in from the south to have to exit from the north only. And then to the funeral home, it would be to the driveway. They're going to they're going to, they're supposed to be contacting all the businesses and let them know what the plan is. And obviously, if it's a funeral, there may be a problem. But they can go up to at least one here. But it's not a huge It's not space. a huge amount of space they're asking it's, it's, for. It's really tight. It's really tight on that street. So they just want to yeah. move the stage back a little bit. Um, so they're not asking for much. It's just we can, we can manage it easily. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Next is a report from the Budget and Finance Committee. Uh, yes, we just met uh, this Friday, uh, September 6th. Um, we went over the bonding uh, meeting. We reviewed the bonding um, for our meeting on uh, full council meeting on 916. Um, and we also were getting ready for the city's next year budget. So. We began with a review and sneak peek of the changes in the master fee schedule, and the staff uh, provided a comprehensive list of each fee that's been compared. They compared to similar fees in other cities in the state of Michigan, and the actual cost to the city is very um, well done. Um, modest increases are recommended on some, but not all fees, and many are staying the same. Overall, Rochester continues to be less than comparable cities. Um, for instance, uh, many use the state of um, Michigan's ICC chart for construction fees, but Rochester does not. They're very detailed. They could just be, you know, just grab it and use it, but they don't. But, and that means that um, they really take a look at the construction fees, and, and many are less. Um, we've looked. Uh, we took a first pass at the budget schedule. So that's, a good, that's available. And as a preliminary review of the upcoming big ticket items, like I said, for the bond meeting review on the 16th, um, we will be prioritizing those and discussing those in depth. <laughs> and um, policy submission for the annual review um, will be discussed at the October 18th budget meeting. Any questions? Very good. Like going on. Good. Okay. Next is report of the cat committee. I'm sorry, I did giggle when I read it. I, I laughed. Committee. I laughed earlier. I, la I laughed out loud. When I told I my husband, I'm like, we have cat committee on this. Yes, cat committee. Hey, Chris, agenda. Chris Not to I, be I, disrespectful of that okay. at all. It's an honor. Yes. Uh, Christian and I are honored to be on the cat committee. Um, really, Chief Seaslack has been 
my, oh, and my, Marilyn my no, cats no. have rec have asked me to be on as well. <laughs> We're I now on. Yes, okay. I, yeah. I think I looped you in on the latest email. So, <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, so Chief Cizlak really has stepped up and has really been helpful in um, educating all of us and kind of gathering resources and being out in the community. Um, it, we we met as a committee um, recently, Nick as well, and um, to talk about a few things. So Chief shared with us a lot of the information and research that he's done. Um, and, and really the one, the humane way to really deal with the cat problem is TNVR. And we had that presentation, right? So I think a lot of people are familiar with what the trap, neuter, vaccinate, and release is about. Um, there is a component where you can also try to rehome and, and um, you know, the kittens especially, the goal will be to adopt those out. Um, if there's other cats that are maybe less feral community cats, um, we would look to rehome those potentially as well, potentially find barns in the area that might be available. So um, the chief has been working with a couple different rescues and um, members of our community. We've decided to start um, kind of focusing where the, the biggest problem right now seems to be in the Grig Street area. Also, um, I think it's Wilcox and Fourth. It is... Uh Yes, Taylor and Fourth. Taylor and yeah, Fourth. Taylor yes. and Fourth. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the second area. I think they estimated that on the Greg Street area where there's been three litters already this year, there's somewhere between 12 to 15 cats currently. Um, and some of the litters have already gone. Um, so they wanted to start there. So what I learned, which was really interesting, is cats as young as four months old can have a litter. Mm -hmm. oh and they can gosh. have, I think, three litters a year. So this cat problem with 12 to 15 can very quickly escalate and I think they said that 75% of them were females um, so they the plan was to spend three to four weeks putting our resources in focusing on that area and then shifting over to kind of the next area um, if they felt like if they spread the resources it wouldn't be quite as effective and you kind of have this short window where we can get those kittens and we can get them out into homes before they become you know, kind of used to living on the streets. Um, so oh, just over the weekend, they captured six kittens. So that was fantastic. We still need to get, I think, the mama cat. Um, there's also a woman, woman from the Troy Chamber um, who is associated with another spray and neuter clinic. And so she said she can help with funding. Mm -hmm. So we're right. getting some funding done okay. as well. Um, and then I think they're going to use the animal control budget um, to help offset the costs. Um, the the nonprofits that are helping us um, aren't asking, but I think it's a, a burden on them. And so we're going to try to help cover the costs of spay and neuter as well as provide some other um, kind of donation to their um, donation in kind to their organizations like food or traps or things that they need as well for their efforts. So. Hopefully we'll start making some progress. But I would say just if there's others in the community where there's problems, um, I know people call the fire department or they call the police. Um, but if they're if they're reaching out, um, we're putting the resources together and can help. So hopefully we'll get ahead of the problem. Wonderful. Thank you. Getting it Sounds done. like progress. Getting it done, yeah. Um, is, is there, thank you, is there any other further public comment? Megan, anybody? No one. Okay. Now we're on to general miscellaneous. Um, Mr. City Treasurer, anything tonight? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just a couple things for uh, reminders on dates. So we have the tabletop on Saturday. We have the uh, special meeting on Monday. And then there's the full-scale county exercise that's being done in the city on Tuesday. A uh, reminder to council uh, for the, all media and electeds uh, that are going to be coming from across Oakland County. Uh, the RSVP uh, is required uh, to get access uh, to the site that day. So um, the, the notice uh, and email address went out in the manager's report. Uh, you're welcome to email myself, and I can just send you who the contact is if that's easier. But uh, if you do plan on attending to see it, um, the RSVP uh, is, is uh, being asked ahead of time. And then... Uh, uh, Council Member Trent mentioned the uh, the preview on the budget process and schedule, 
And as was talked earlier, the PAC meeting is uh, currently tentative for October 17th is when we would be having the, uh, the PAC meeting on the schedule. So okay. that well, is I all I have. I got lost on parking. The parking advisory uh, <laughs> committee. <laughs> Council Member Hauser. Very quick question. On the 16th for that special meeting, what, is that at 6 o'clock? We had it at 6.30. Was it 6? Was it? 6.30 to 8.30. I think it was 6.30. 6.30 on the 16th. 6.30, okay. Yes. okay. That Monday, was in the manager's and then report. And then 8 a.m. on Saturday. It's not yes. there, right? Remember we moved it? 8 o'clock yeah, on the Saturday. Yeah, 8 o'clock for Saturday. Correct. And both yep, are at the firehouse. Correct. So 9.16 is 6.30 to 8.30? Mm-hmm. Correct. Okay. Yes. At the, at the I firehouse. I had that 6 to 8. Okay. Okay. 6.30 to 8.30. Okay. Yeah. Come at 6. We'll okay. have We'll have we'll a we'll chat before. We'll chat. Yeah. But is 6.30 now? 630, yeah. 630 to 830 on 916. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's on my calendar. Right. And the tabletop is a week from today. 914. Is the budget okay. meeting, and then this I'm Saturday is the tabletop meeting. At the fire station. Yeah. Both at the fire station. Oh, oh, 16th at the fire station. Is that correct, Anthony? Both correct. at the fire station. Fire station, yes. And for the meeting on the, the budget meeting, um, I'm going to talk with Marcy, and we're going to have an agenda put out for that. But, you know, everybody knows what the agenda is. Pretty much you, I think they should see that schedule. That's here. The 916. 916 it's is at the, the firehouse. firehouse. I think they should see oh, the charts. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, Saturday and Monday, both at the okay. firehouse. So, yeah, if you come oh. here, the doors will be locked. We'll be yeah, locked that's right. That's so, right. Yeah. so you would have, you're going to send out the agenda with the, the, the list of line-itemed capital yeah, um, we're still finalizing probably, it with, uh, the, okay. with the mayor, but it'll be sent okay. out, yes. Okay, yeah, so they'll have that ahead of time as well. Correct. Okay. To ruminate and to think ruminate. about. Yes. Exactly. Um, uh, Mr. Clerk, anything tonight? Nothing tonight, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. Mr. City Attorney? Uh, nothing, thank you. Council Member King? Nothing for me this evening. Mayor Pro Tem Salvia? Um, yes. So uh, last week, um, I spent some time with Chief George in the police department. I did a ride along. Um, I learned a lot about our police department and uh, dispatch. Um, but most interestingly, I learned about um, people who are, are in our community and probably all around our country that call themselves sovereign citizens. So I witnessed an arrest of a sovereign citizen someone who feels as though they are only subject to the, their own laws, not the laws of um, our city. So um, to the chief's comment earlier, you know, this puts uh, drain on our resources, our police officers, because um, in this case, this person was intent upon driving their vehicle. They had been uh, taking some drugs and so, uh, our officers arrested them. So it was it was quite the eye opener. And uh, I would recommend um, all of council take the time to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a great experience. They also showed me all the equipment, the things that uh, we've approved for the vehicles, computers, et cetera. Um, so thank you, Chief. Thank you for uh, the team for letting me do that. It was it was it was great. It was a great experience. Um, what else do I have? Um, September 11th is uh, Wednesday. So I believe at the fire department at 8.30, we're having a 9-11 event. Um, also, we talked about stormwater tonight. Um, Alec Mizikar is going to an Oakland County 2024 stormwater summit. So he is going to be there. Obviously, Commissioner Nash is going to be speaking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I did talk to Alex today. He is going to that. So he will be a part of that. And hopefully, we have some more learning on that topic. Um, the last thing I had was um, I was looking at the calendar for the Big Bright Light Show. I had some family that wanted to come in, and I realized we're turning the lights on November 25th, and our city council meeting was scheduled for the Tuesday when we approved our whole schedule. Um, in the past, we have always done it the Tuesday after, but that week this year, it's also Thanksgiving. So I guess I would like to make a motion to move that city council meeting from the Tuesday, the 26th, to Monday, November 18th, and that would leave November and December where we have two Monday meetings back to back. And that way we don't have so Lanya, uh, city council, and Thanksgiving all in one week. Yeah, and I talked to the mayor for time on this. It's just if, if people 
we've had that on our calendar, so just want to know if, pe if people wanted to change it or if they were going to be in town, or um, that works. I'm I available on the 18th, so if it helps, whatever, yeah, yeah. I've got no issues so, with that. I so, don't have an objection, but I will not be here on the 18th. So it would be on the 11th and the 18th? Yes. So then I think if... November the, 11th and 18th. Right, I think if... Ms. Council Member Sage is not going to be here, then we need to have it on the 26th. On the 26th, not the 25th. Oh, because the 25th is when the lights go. Correct. Right. 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 So, we'll so when we approved our schedule, okay. we said, hey, move it to Tuesday. Okay. Right. But last year, moving it to Tuesday didn't have it in the same week as Thanksgiving. So oh, that was my concern. I see, but Council so, Member Sage can't come. I got you. Okay. So I, I made a motion. Yeah. Okay, is there... Is there support for the motion for the mayor pro tem to move it to the 18th? I don't know. Didn't you say we need everybody at that meeting, though? Yeah. Oh, you do? So. Yeah. Oh, right. You're not going to be in town? I will not. Okay. All right. Well, we just need to be the troublemaker here. <laughs> so. Well, but that, I mean, that, that's the vacation. That was how it was scheduled for that Tuesday, so there's okay. no, right. There's right. no right. shame okay. in Okay. Not, not no, 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 no. Uh, council members. Totally I teasing. mean, I hate to not miss somebody. Um, it's okay. I'm, we can yeah. we can we can cram it in Thanksgiving week. All right. Okay. I, just for the record, I don't have any issues moving yeah. it. But if if I don't have an issue either way, we, we should have caught it initially. Okay. But, you know, That's fine. Yeah. Me too. And and council member Sage, your your business commitment can't be changed. This is actually a personal commitment. So <laughs> okay. all right, then, then probably change. not. Okay, um, is there anything further? Um, let me check. Hold on. Nope, that's it. Councilmember Sage? Uh, nothing this evening, sir. Councilmember Jones? Um, yes, I were, I got to just say, if anybody went to Arts and Apples, it looks like it was quite the success. I, I worked one of the gates. Oh, that's um, right. <laughs> two shifts on Sunday, one mm -hmm. with my husband, and uh, for Rochester Area Youth Assistance, they are kind um, giving gates to different nonprofits and, and the community and um, they get a we get a percent of the, the profit that came in that gate um, mm -hmm. so that's kind of a, our donation that came mm -hmm. in the gate so that was super exciting and it was a, a good sunny day and that was fun um, we did have a Raya meeting and I did give the schedule but I'm I don't think I'm listed to report on that I did give them the calendar schedule of my meetings so I'm just gonna do a quick little we just have a couple things coming up a couple dates um, our, we have an annual meeting. You will all be invited to that, and that is on October 11th. Um, there's a spaghetti dinner at the fire hall on October 19th, and that is for um, going to, along with the Halloween trick-or-treaters that night. Um, so those are the two the big things coming up. And then um, Council, Man um, uh, Council Member King brought up the cemetery BRL stuff. So you, you had me interested. I'm on the cemetery committee. So I read the or all the ordinance and all the rules involved in the cemetery. So that was interesting. And then I called um, Mr. Pixley to get more information about how burials work there. Um, and he said, um, as we know, um, and I think it was mentioned at the meeting, that um, the cemetery requires that um, all of the caskets are in a concrete burial vault. And a lot of them are pre-lined. The family adds that, so that's even another layer. And he said um, nothing disintegrates um, as far as casket and how it's buried. And he said there is no runoff of chemicals. Um, there has never been an issue in our area or any in the state he knows of, either environmental or uh, with the water supply. Um, he also said about 50% are still caskets. Um, I was thinking that would be a little different, that there'd be more um, cremations. But you piqued my interest also on the different ideas regarding burials. So just real quick, um, what is the natural burial, which is what you mentioned. Um, the natural burial, which is also con called the green burial, involves placing the body of the deceased in the earth in the most natural, environmentally friendly, friendly way to facilitate its return to the elements. And it may include a use of biodegradable casket or shroud instead of the metal casket and natural cooling methods instead of embalming avoiding and avoiding that use um, of the concrete vault and natural groundskeeping methods like planting flowers instead of mowing 
So I just wanted to kind of put that out there because we talked about it. And um, I mean, I, I am on the cemetery committee. I don't know the future discussion on this. If people do want to do something more environmentally friendly, um, you know, it's a historical cemetery, so I don't know who you talk to about such things. Um, I don't know enough to answer that question, but I just wanted to bring a little more information around it. So. Wow, that was great. Yeah, we'll see you. if in the yeah. future it could be. I'm glad you brought it up. I had never heard of it before. So natural burials. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like that. I mean, it does make sense. So I just mm -hmm. don't know what the process might be if we consider that something direction. I don't know if it's a legal issue. I yeah, don't I don't, know. don't know enough. I don't know that you can convert prior. Well, that's what I. I'm, it's a, no, not I think prior. it's go for it. <laughs> oh no, we're not. We would no, not take not a body up no. and make the change. No, no. <laughs> but just it, even moving forward as far as how the cemetery is set up. Could one area of the cemetery be donated, you know, dedicated to that? I don't know. So it's worth more investigation. So yeah. that's it for me. And, of course, it's not going to affect any of us anyway. Uh, right. Probably not. You mean because we're never going to pass away? Or? Exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly what I meant. <laughs> I already have two pots there, right? so I've already planned <laughs> that. I, uh, I, guess. I don't know. Just <laughs> not, according, the funeral in the duck pond. not according to Jim Morrison. I, he, he, none of us get out of here alive. Yeah. I mean, that's what he said. I, I mean, he's, my, uh, he's my go-to on that. Um, so yeah, um, yeah. Our Naples Festival. I it was. Uh, I was there uh, at the ribbon cutting with um, Mayor Bixson and um, uh, Pro Tem um, Nancy Salvia. I mean Pro Tem Salvia. It was a beautiful afternoon, and I was. I did not make it back, but I saw a lot of people going. Yeah. I think it was um, well attended. Um, so I also would like to um, say thank the Paint Creek Trailways Commission um, putting on their Labor, Labor Day walk um, and run, and I'm, uh, I did run, and um, it was a beautiful day as well. So yeah, and then, you know we all love our trails, and if you want to uh, uh, participate or um, you know donate, just um, you know. Look them up online, Pink Creek Trailways Commission. Just Google it. A little ad for Pink yeah. Creek Trailways. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or uh, ask our uh, liaison, um, Council Member Sage, and I hear he's the chair of the committee of that, of that commission. I am mm -hmm. currently. That's correct. So that's it. Council Member Hauser. Uh, nothing, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to also say that Art and Apples, I believe, was a great success, and I want to thank the fire chief, the police chief, and the CERT team that was out there to helping out all the volunteers. Uh, it was a great community event. Um, so thank you to everybody. And uh, meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Boy, I got a lot of mail.